the economy is in trouble. The GDP is a bunch of BS. It has nothing to do with it. And it, it, it's just, it's now just a number. It's no more a real sign of whether there's growth or whether we're in good shape or not. It, it's all a bunch of um, smoke and mirrors, guy. It's not real. We have a horrible economy. We have debt to GDP has never been higher. People are making less than they are spending. Americans are funding everything via credit card. We have never had so many Americans at full credit card limit and paying the minimum. If you're not in the upper 10 or 20% of the earning population, you are in a massive recession. You're lucky you can survive. You can't feed your family. You've got all kinds of issues. And of course, nobody cares because the stock market's going higher. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy on Twitter and, of course, your host for this channel. And I'm looking forward to welcoming back Todd Horwitz. He's, he, he's a former floor trader. And, of course, here's a warning. Whenever I chat with floor traders, I speed up my, 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 my language. I get faster. I get more active. I get hyperactive. Todd is also a fast talker. YouTube has a function. You can slow down the speed of the conversation. I do that when I speak with Jim Urio. I do it when I speak with Todd Horowitz. You, you might have to because there's going to be a lot of information packed into the next 25 minutes here. And I'm really looking forward to catching up with him. Last time we spoke was in February. A lot has happened since. And a couple things I want to follow up with Todd. And... Uh, Maybe well, let, let's jump right in. You know, let, let's let's stop the spiel. Let's jump right in. Todd, good to see you again. Thanks for making the time again. Kai, great to be here with you. And uh, Jim Yorio is a great guy too. I, go to, I used to go to his restaurant as well as trade with him. So, Oh, there you go. Oh, that reminds me. I've got a five-hour layover on my way home in a couple of weeks. I might have to stop by at his restaurant there in Chicago. So Very good. Very perfect. Handy. I have to make note of that. So, <laughs> But uh, l l let's dive right into the discussion. And uh, we have seen a GDP revision, an upward revision of GDP. Yet, real economy doesn't feel like it is doing as well as the GDP is indicating. En enlighten us, Todd. What, what are your thoughts on that whole situation? It, it's all a bunch of um, smoke and mirrors, Kai. It's not real. We have a horrible economy. We have debt to GDP has never been higher. Okay, We're, we're in, a, in a position that because the Fed can continue to try to manipulate currency, that it makes the numbers look more than they are. But at the end of the day, people are making less then they are spending, okay? The, the, the economy is in trouble. The GDP is a bunch of BS. It has nothing to do with it. And it, it, it's just, it's now just a number. It's no more a real sign of whether there's growth or whether we're in good shape or not. What, what do you hinge on that? Like maybe we have to break that down a little bit. When you say the real economy is in shambles, right? You, you mentioned consumer spending is a big topic. Um, the consumer is spending more, but how is he financing it? I think that's one important topic we need to sort of look at? Well, they're financing it through credit card debt. I mean, we've never had, in, in this stage, listen, the numbers are don't make sense, right? Because the numbers, you know, with inflation and growth over years, I mean, just to give you a perspective, when I started trading, the Dow was 800. Now the Dow is 42,000, okay? In 1985, I made a hell of a lot less money and lived a lot better than I live in 2024. So Americans are funding everything via credit card. We have never had so many Americans at full credit card limit and paying the minimum. Okay, so it doesn't matter what the dollar amount is, it's that they're, the fact that they are fully financed and trying to pay everything through their credit card and they're paying the minimum. Now, you know the minimum rate, if you're paying the minimum on credit cards, you're paying what is known by the mob is you usury rates, okay? It's, a, it's illegal except if you're a credit card company that can charge your consumers 23 or 24, 25% to finance that money, which means that if you're at limit, you're never going to get out of debt, okay? Which says that the middle class is a disaster right now. I mean, if you're not in the upper 10 or 20% of the earning population, you are in a massive recession. You're lucky you can survive. You can't feed your family. You've got all kinds of issues. And of course, nobody cares because the stock market's going higher. Exactly. It's, it's being overshadowed by that. It seems like everything's honky dory because the stock market is doing better. Everyone's 401ks are probably okay for now, but uh, they're at risk, of course. Um, before we get to the, the stock market, I definitely want to talk about the S&P 500 and the momentum in the S&P 500. Um, one, one topic I brought up with Nomi Prince the other day as well is uh, wage growth. And uh, if, if you want to counterbalance everything a little bit, wage growth has been around 4.85% as well. And then we, we got some interesting comments on that YouTube video. It's like, 
what what world do we live in? Nobody's been getting five percent wage growth and uh, uh, higher wages. Everybody's maybe three percent, three and a half at best. What what are your thoughts on on wage growth in in general, and like how is it counterbalancing what you're what you're seeing in the real economy? How about this? I don't care what the wage growth is. The simple numbers are this. Okay, Americans are spending about two percent more than they're earning. Okay, whatever number you want to assign to it. If you say wage growth is five percent, then they're spending seven percent. Okay, you say it's three point eight percent, then they're spending five point eight percent. The bottom line is Americans are not making enough to pay their bills. They're not making enough to pay their family. So whatever number you want to assign to it, the bottom line is they are spending more. Look at the PCE that came out on on Friday the. Uh, what was it, the 31st or the 30th, okay? They're spending 2% more than they're earning. So what does it matter what I'm earning? If I'm still spending more than what I'm earning, then the number what I'm earning means nothing because I still can't survive And how many months, how many years it will take me to go broke at that same ratio. True points, true points, really interesting. Like, and it's all about not uh, discretionary spending, it's about necessary, what's, what's the other word? How about um, rent? How about yeah, rent, rent, mortgage, mortgage like food? insurance. The necessities that necessities you have to, exactly. mandatory things that you have to pay. You have to pay your rent. You have to buy groceries to pay for your family so they can eat. You have to make your car payment if you have a car payment. Okay, those are payments you cannot ignore. Those are are not choices you make. Those are commitments you made whenever you bought what you bought. And if you have it, you have to pay rent. You got to unless you want to live on the street like they do in San Francisco. Yeah. When, when you look at the quarterly numbers, I, I think Lowe and Target reported last week or a couple of weeks ago. Um, do, do you look at the discretionary spending? Is, is Target selling more of the, the discretionary items like an extra carpet or something or um, decorations and stuff? Like, w w what do those numbers tell you? I don't think that there's, there's much discretionary spending at all. I think people are again, I, I believe that people are struggling just to get by. I don't I don't see a lot of people running out again. We have to remember that now. You know, and when we when you're in a recessionary period, which I think we are, but again, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about that later. But when you're in an economy that is falling apart, when you're in a country that things are falling apart, okay, all of a sudden the very wealthy are now doing the spending and the buying at the WalMarts and the Targets and of, of the world. Okay, the, the the lower group of people aren't buying anything there. They can't afford to buy anything. They're lucky they can afford to buy groceries. So there is not a lot of discretionary income around. For the, the bottom 75 to 80 percent of the population, there is not a lot of extra discretionary spending. I don't care what the numbers say. I don't care what they come out with. The bottom line is retail sales suck. OK, the, the economy sucks. And we're seeing a destruction of a country of people that are being the, the, being told lies from their government. That's a big topic by itself, and uh, we might have to table that one. But uh, maybe let's talk about a government independent organization, the Fed. <laughs> um, so, uh, I, I think we we need to touch on that because uh, they're trying to counterbalance whatever is happening in the real economy by cutting rates. At least that's what Jerome Powell said. And uh, I've said it before in other interviews, but I think he sounded scared in Jackson Hole when he was talking about the, the labor market in particular, 4.3% uh, unemployment rate. Um, what kind of tools does the Fed actually have? Like besides cutting rates, is there anything else they can do? And uh, what do they need to do to actually counter what is happening right now? Well, let's first discuss what the Fed is. The Fed is a cartel. Okay, the Fed is more of a criminal organization. I'm not calling them criminals, but they're more interested in basically stealing from people. Look, you can go back to the 1600s in England when central banking started. They continue to wind down and, and manipulate dollars and, and, and money to make it worth less. OK, so if you go back to 1913, when the Federal Reserve started by four very not good people, the Rothschild family, Warburg, Paul Warburg, uh, the J.P. Morgan and the Rockefellers, they didn't have the interests of you and me at heart when they when they developed the Federal Reserve. Their interest was for themselves so they could control the banking system, which they have done. The Fed is really not independent. And I don't know if this is a political move or not. OK, I think Ron Paul is right that we need to end the Fed or at least have a fair audit of the Fed and know what's really going on. But what they're doing now, the reason that they're cutting rates now is not because they cannot control inflation. They couldn't control it before, OK, by raising rates. So now you understand that everything that we buy has a federal tax base on it, right? There's federal taxes paid on every product you go out and buy. There's a federal excise tax on gasoline, food, anything you go out and buy. 
So by lowering the rates, we are going to see an inflation spike once again. And we're going to go back the other direction of what they thought was coming down. Now, we all know that inflation has not come down. It just was growing at supposedly a slower pace. We're going to get into a, a much speedier inflation curve again. And of course, really what that is doing is it's called the hidden tax of inflation. Because now, as we go to the store and have to pay more taxes on the goods and services that we are buying, it is lining the coffers of the federal government, which is continuing to piss our money away in places like Ukraine and in China and all over the world, other than right here in the United States. And that is lining the pockets of the politicians. So it's more of a shell game or a Ponzi scheme, which is what we're watching what the Federal Reserve is doing. Do you see QE happening again at, at some point in, in that regard, in that scenario? Yeah, when the banks go out, when the banks go under again and they have to bail them out again, yeah, I see it. I mean, and there's no doubt that the banks are going to go down again. And, and again, I, I said this in 2008. I'm going to say it right now on your show. Let the banks go out of business. Who needs them? The, the whole capitalist system is based on if you're not strong enough to stay in business, then you should be forced to close. You want to bail out somebody, bail out the depositors, bail out the Americans that have their hard earned money in those banks. Screw the banks. What kind of business model do you have when you can make billions of dollars? Okay. And if you go out of business, if you get if you get into trouble, the Federal Reserve and the government are gonna come and bail you out. Where does that make sense? In any of the size of world, does it make sense to bail out a business that is a profitable business? And if they don't make profit, they get the bailed out by the Federal Reserve. Yeah, well, we've seen uh, Janet Yellen guarantee all savings and banks and all that, like in uh, Silicon Valley Bank. It it's all guaranteed. Don't worry about it. it. Like, how, how does that work, right? Um, Todd, back in February, you said uh, interest rates will probably go up. Now, uh, Jerome Powell says, well, we have to cut. You know, we don't like what we're seeing. Um, how, how's your prediction developed? You mentioned before we hit the record button that you have a theory about that. Well, I mean, again, I, as we saw, now we haven't gone down yet. There's talk that September, right? And if you look at the Fed funds rate, there's 100% probability that they're going to, but we know nothing's ever 100%. <laughs> But if they do cut rates, it's for one reason. It's to what I just talked about, increase the tax base. It's going to increase taxes that we're going to pay because it's going to bring back inflation to a higher level once again, which means that secretly Americans will pay more federal tax through the goods that they buy when they go to the grocery store, when they go to the gas station, because we do pay federal tax on all goods and services. You pay federal tax on your income. So at the end of the day, all they're really doing is creating more tax dollars to be paid by Americans, screw the inflation, because in what world does trying to stimulate the economy, okay, with lowering rates, bring down inflation, which they've continually said is out of control. All right, I happen to know that gasoline is 65% higher globally, or nation, United States wide, higher in some places, lower in other, but 65% higher than it was when Joe Biden took office. I know groceries, are two to three times more expensive than when President Biden took office. So in what world does lowering rates bring down inflation? It is in no world that that happens. I don't, I don't see it happening. Even just the mention of lowering rates just uh, had house prices rally yet again, right? So um, there, there's no correlation, in my opinion. People are just waiting anx anxiously for that to happen. But they've um, been waiting since last October. Let's remember yeah. that when we talked in, in, in just after the first of the year, okay, that I said that they wouldn't be able to lower. And I think there was a greater chance of a hike. Now, again, they haven't been able to lower yet. They were supposed to lower in March, all the way through. And now finally, maybe it'll come in September, but this is no longer bullish for the market. This will become a bearish thing for the market because this is admitting that we are in a recession. That's exactly my next point, Todd, is uh, like, what has the market priced in right now? We're, we're topping out seemingly at 5,600 points in the S&P 500. Uh, it, what is priced in? Like, where, where are things going to go? Because I feel like September 18th, they announce a cut, market drops off. Is that uh, what you expect as well? I would agree. With, I would agree with that. But again, one of the problems with trying to read this market and time the market and try to figure out what they're doing without seeing the action before it, you know, the Dow made an all-time new high last week. Okay. Uh, the, the NASDAQ, the SP is certainly close. The only ones that aren't close enough right now is the NASDAQ is a little bit away and the Russell is way away. Uh, and again, the NASDAQ is kind of signaling that there's a lot of weakness. I would believe that should there be the rate cut that they're talking about on September 18th, I would believe there would first initially be a spike rally, a relief rally that it's finally done. And then I think that would might be the beginning of the collapse. And this could end up being what we saw in 2008 when, if you recall, 
in September of 2008, Paulson came on Face the Nation and said, the banks are safe and sound, everything's great. And of course, October, they weren't so safe and sound. And I could see almost an instant replay of, what, of that happening once again. It seems like the markets are extremely nervous, Todd. And uh, we've seen a bit, a glimpse of that August 5th. And uh, some of my guests on the show called it Black Monday. Uh, I think that's a bit of an extreme. Uh, but we've seen a, a quick and rapid correction in the S&P and then a quick and rapid correction to the upside yet again. But uh, a lot of money tried to exit the door or through the door at all at once. Is that something, is that a constant risk and volatility, of course? Um, First of all, volatility is extremely low. Okay, again, I don't, I, I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I've been hearing this since 1987, okay? You know, the 1987, October 19th pressures I was trading on the floor during, okay? Didn't just happen on Monday the 19th. That market was going down for three weeks before, okay? And that was the culmination. That was actually a buying opportunity on October 19th. The same thing happened on August 5th, the markets were getting hammered four days before that. It wasn't that they just suddenly went down and the overall percentage loss, two and a half percent on the Dow Jones. If anybody had a stock that was on two and a half percent, they wouldn't even think about it. But people get so confused and so enamored with these big numbers. Oh my God, the Dow's on a thousand points. That's two and a half percent. I don't know anybody would get nervous about two and a half percent. Okay. But yet when you hear the big number, suddenly there's a major panic, but that was the culmination that was the end of it. You saw the volatility index spike up to 66 and then fall back. Now it's back to 12 or 14. So again, to me, that was no big deal. It was part of it. And, and as I was talking to all the, the people that I deal with, it's a buying opportunity because right now the market still want to go higher. That was a one day sell off, but it really wasn't because it was selling off days before. Just look at the chart. You can see that the market had come down very hard going into that. And that was the final puke, as we call it, on the trading floor. Yeah. But one of the reasons for the massive drop off, of course, was the reversal or pretend reversal of the yen carry trade, meaning you can borrow cheaply in yen and then deploy in U.S. dollars or in the U.S. markets. You know, bank the arbitrage or take take almost free money, put it into Nvidia and and let it ride. Um, quick question, like maybe as a follow up to 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 that, and uh, I think it was a YouTube comment I've read uh, under one of our videos is what happens when the U.S. cuts now and Japan stays stable? Do you think uh, more money will flow back into the U.S. then? Maybe reversing the reversal? I don't, I don't know. It's so hard to say. And let's, let's be honest, okay? How many people, A, really understand the carry trade, okay? And how many people actually can participate in the carry trade? I mean, the carry trade is not for somebody who's trading with $1,000, okay? Arbitrages are done on huge numbers to make small percentage basis on an overall trade that you're locking in. How many people, A, can understand that trade and can actually make that trade? I think the media, everybody makes too much of a big deal out of the carry trade because what is one percent of the trading population able to make the yen carry trade yeah no it, it is absolutely true and uh like it is the big funds and it's the big algos that uh, that can invest in that like it's not the mom and pops and joe joe and jane right um that can invest here um todd we're, we're jumping around a lot but uh, there are lots of topics to cover like I, we need to talk U.S. dollar because that was uh, or the U.S. dollar has been under pressure the last few weeks. It's recovering slightly. It's over 101, the Dixie. Um, what, what do you make of the U.S. dollar, especially in, in light of what we just discussed, potential Fed rate cut? Well, here's the problem. The fiat currency system itself is one of the most it's almost like the cartel of the Federal Reserve. Right. It's almost like their drug that they get to play prices with. And I think you're looking at because governments want more globalization, you're seeing basically a race to the bottom. They take turns pounding their currency, okay, and, and making these things happen because they're trying to really destroy what capitalism is in our country and other programs. And I, I think that, you know, again, it's hard for me to imagine that we'll see much more weakness in the dollar. I would think there'd be a little bit of a rally. But again, you go to the other point where everybody talks about well, we need a weaker dollar so that we can export commodities. And I go, well, that never made sense. It doesn't make sense to me today. It never made sense to me. And nobody has been able to give me a satisfactory answer as to why that is necessary. If you're really concerned about the dollar and you want it weaker so you can export more, lower the price on your goods. You can create your own lower dollar. So again, there's too much manipulation in the currency market because there's nothing backing any of the currencies other than the full faith and credit of the governments that there's, they're done by. And we all know that the governments themselves are all worthless 
and basically are stealing the citizens of their country's money. No, hundred hundred percent. And uh, I don't want to go. To, I don't want to get political, but we need to talk politics for a second because Donald Trump wanted a weaker dollar when he ran for office uh, last time. Um, now, now it looks like the U.S. dollar is weakening, but for a di- with a different effect. Like, is that something you would uh, run run on again? Like, is that something that makes sense? Like, make America great again? Does a weaker dollar actually help the U.S.? I don't know. If, again, this is above my pay grade from a trading standpoint and from an, an economist standpoint. The manipulation of the dollar, again, it, it all ties together through inflation, through everything else that goes on and what weaker dollars buy. And would a weaker dollar make sense? Yeah, if you want to make up some BS and, and pay more dollars to somebody so you weaken the dollar so that the pay is really the same. Again, this is an argument that I don't, I don't think is really legitimate. I don't think this is something that is important. And and, and I do remember President Trump when he, wanted, when he brought that, and President Trump also wanted lower interest rates, which at the time made sense. I'm not thrilled about it. See, here's the problem that I have, Kai, is that the markets should be free. The markets are able to price themselves. So the dollar would tell you, if you would leave it alone and get the Federal Reserve out and the central banking system out of their currencies, the market will tell you what anything is worth. Why? Because a buyer will be a buyer and a seller will be a buyer. They'll meet and they'll make price discovery and that'll tell you what it's worth. This goes down to interest rates. I know we're running out of time, but I just want to give you a quick analogy. The true free market rate on interest is about 11 or 12 or 13 percent in the United States. How do I know that? Because if you go to all the peer-to-peer lenders, which where most people have to go these days because the banks won't lend them the money, they're paying 11, 12 and 13 percent with Prosper, Cabbage and all those other peer-to-peer lenders. That is what the free market tells you what the price is worth. And if the, if the governments would get out of the pricing products and worrying about price controls and gouging and all those other things, the free market will tell you what something's worth. Because if I go to one grocery store, I don't like the price. I'm going to go to another grocery and, and find a cheaper price that fits my budget better. So price discovery will price all asset classes, including interest rates. And until the Federal Reserve gets the, you know, out of the way, it doesn't make any sense because whatever they do is worthless. Baba, one last topic. Everything can be backed by gold. And we need to talk gold price real quick. $2,500. I'm, I'm surprised, quite honestly, that we are at this level already. Um, yeah, the move I was quite violent. Well, you did. You said 23 to 24 on it. We're trading at 2,500 now, right? Yeah. The, the move was quite violent, in my opinion, for a 5,000-year-old 5 5, relic. It moved rather quickly. Um, how, how sustainable is that move? And to where, where do you see it headed? I think it's going higher. I mean, I think, again, I don't, I don't make big, gigantic calls like it's going to 5,000. To me... The next target would for me would be 27, 2800. And I think it'll probably get there this year. I think there's a good chance that we'll continue to hold the highs and make new highs coming going forward. I think there's a need. You can see, listen, El Costco selling gold. Like every time they get in, they sell it out. Uh, I think people are fi- signing, is finally, finally starting to realize that with all the turbulence throughout the globe in governments, not in, you know, the, whatever's going on, but th- I think they're realizing that they may need gold and silver as a currency at some point again. We may need that because you may not be able to eat because your currency be worthless and people may not take it. And I'm not, listen, I don't want anybody to go out and run out and buy gold in a panic here. I'm not telling you to worry about it. I'm saying that I believe that everybody should have some representation ownership of physical metals, not paper. There's a big difference because I don't think there's enough gold to cover all the paper that's written out there. So what I would be doing is I'd buy some gold. And I think people are starting to realize between cryptocurrency and between gold, silver and platinum, that you may need something as an alternative to the U.S. dollar or the euro currency or any of the other currencies around the globe. Because, again, we're seeing a big shift. And really, unfortunately, the shift is more to either socialism, communism or Marxism, which is not good for any capitalist. 100 percent. Absolutely. Uh that we definitely want to avoid falling into that trap again. Uh, we, we don't need it. Todd, <laughs> time just flies with you. And uh, we cover so much ground in a very short time period. And uh, really appreciate your time. We need to catch up no- uh, November 6th. We need I'm to- ready. I'll November 6th. That would be a lot of fun to get you back on that day uh, to sort of gauge what is happening in the markets and what can we expect the market to do uh, post-election. So... Really appreciate Thanks, your time. Thank you so much for making the effort here on Labor Day. Actually, we're recording this on Labor Day, so much I'm appreciate. <laughs> well, markets are closed. What are you doing all well, day? No, the markets are open. They're open electronically. Oh, I thought because I know the Canadian markets the are closed today. Down so. seven points. The uh, Nasdaq's down twenty-five. 
<laughs> Canadian Dollar markets are closed. That's why. Because <laughs> Tuesday, the day after Labor Day, is a big news day in the junior mining space. So everybody dumps their news tomorrow because everybody's gone today. So, Todd, appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Oh, by the way, where can we follow your work? Sorry. Uh, BubbaTrading.com. And if you have any questions from this interview, you can email me direct at Bubba at BubbaTrading.com. I'll be happy to answer. Fantastic. We'll put all of that down below. Todd, Bubba, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. All the best to you and to everybody else. Thank you so much for tuning in to Soar Financially. Quick whirlwind update here on the markets. As I said before, you can change the speed of this conversation on YouTube. It is super easy. Just go into the settings, that little wheel there, and slow it down. We really appreciate you tuning in. If you haven't done so, please hit that like and subscribe button. Leave a comment. What do you think is happening? How are the markets behaving? Have you sold? Are you still long in the S&P? I really want to know. And uh, you might have noticed, I love referencing some of the YouTube comments uh, in, in my interviews because it gives us a real-world perspective. I don't live in the U.S., so everything is a bit different for me. I'm always the outsider looking in. I do travel a lot, but I do want to hear from you. So thank you so much for all the comments. Keep them coming. And we'll be back with lots more here on Soar Financially. Thank you.